Hey guys, today we are in our series called Hope is Here. Say that out loud with me. Hope is here. That's right. It's an amazing series and we've been talking about how God brought hope to the earth. I don't know about you, but to the cancer patient, there's only one hope. His name is Jesus. To the person who can't keep their marriage together, there's a hope, and his name is Jesus. To the person who recognizes that this old wicked life is going to come to an end one day, and then there's an afterlife life, the hope, his name is Jesus. For each and every one of us, as we go through trials and tribulations, God the Father sent the hope to the world, and his name is Jesus. And we've been celebrating the hope process. There's a process by which God brought hope to the earth. There's a process that he engaged with his people. When we started into this series, I reminded you that the books of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the last book of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. In the next 400 years after this book, God does not speak to his people and to the book of Matthew. And how does he speak to his people at the end of 400 years? He speaks to them by bringing hope to them. There's a process that has to happen, though. See, the people of God, if you'll read the book of Malachi, they begin to go away from the Lord. They begin to be adulterous. They loved everything but God. And they continually complained and were frustrated and that frustrated the Lord. So the Lord said, you know what? I'm going to give you to yourself. Go. Do what you want to do. I'll back up from the relationship. Come on. You ever tried to date somebody who didn't want to date you? Come on. Now he's just like, whatever. God bless you. Hope it works out for you, loser. Anyway, and so God kind of backed up. He just kind of backed up for 400 years. And for 400 years... Those people were the people of Israel. They they were ki- they were kidnapped. They they were beaten. They were imprisoned. Their temple was destroyed. All these things happened in those four years. And somewhere in the process of that, they got a little smarter and said, "God, we want you back." And God said, "Okay, but I'm going to bring you through a process before I bring you to hope." And the first step in that process that we talked about was that literally when we talked about this two weeks ago, the first step in the hope process for you and me and for the children of Israel is that they literally had to come back and repent of their sin. They had, to, they, had to, they, had to, they had to get it right. And guys, if we live in sin, and that, we're all sin prone as Christians, but we're not sin committed. And so ha- every now and then we just have to recalibrate. So you know what? I'm sorry. I've let this sin get in my life. And the moment we start doing that, hope is able to start coming back to the pathway down to, into our life. The second thing that we learned was in the process of hope coming into our life is we had to come back to a place where we submitted to his guidance. So many times we want to lead our own life. We've got this pathway. And I asked you last week, where do you get your, your, life, your, your life direction from? From, where, from whence did you get your worldview from? How do you view life? And what, where did that come from? From what your daddy said back when you were in second grade? From the way you were raised in a certain part of the world? That's why we have so much prejudice and things like that. It's because, because we were given life principles and life guidance by certain people who were broken. And, and, and they didn't have truth. And so what happens is when you and I surrender ourselves and say, Lord, I'll let you lead me. You guide me. What your Bible says, I will do. What you say, I will follow. And when we come to that, hope begins to enter our life. Why? Because now we're not trying to drive the vehicle, but we're letting him drive, up, drive our lives in the right direction. And so as we were looking at these different pieces, we connected them all through the Christmas story. And what the Bible said was happening in those early moments uh, in the life of Jesus and his birth and coming to earth. And so today we're going to look at the third step in this whole process. And this is what I'm calling a generous response or the generous response. Would you say that out loud with me? The generous response. One more time, say it. The generous response. And I love this passage of scripture that we've been studying in this this whole series. And it says it in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 21. And his name shall be the hope of all the world. And his name shall be the hope of all the world. And I believe that with all of my heart, that we are in a Christmas time. And I believe that, uh, you know, I was talking to some guys before service and they said, you know, at our company, we're not allowed to say Merry Christmas. I said, you what? I said, we had that in the eighties. They actually tried to take Christ out of the Christmas and put X miss because they wanted to take Christ out of the Christmas. You can't have Christmas without Christ. This is about Christ coming to the earth. He is the hope of all the world. Friends, you and I have to stay the course. Oh, no, 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 no. This is about Jesus, the gift of hope coming to the earth. And so we see that in that passage that says, in the gift to all the world, he is the hope of all the world. His name is Jesus. And I want to ask you this question. How do you think gift giving came about as a Christmas holiday, you know, uh, tradition? Where do you think that came from? 
Do you think he came from some guy who was a nice dude named Nicholas and uh, kids who didn't have gifts, and so he went around? I, that probably did happen. I mean, obviously, historically, it did. But that's not where gift-giving came from. Gift-giving came from the book of Matthew. If you'll turn there with me in verse 2. We celebrate Christmas by giving gifts to other be, others because of Matthew chapter 2. And we'll look in verse 10. This is the storyline of the magi or the wise men. And most all of your little, you know, uh, your, your little nativity scenes, you'll find the magi there. And you'll find the shepherds. And they combine a couple pieces of scripture to create this nativity scene. They Actually, when Jesus was born, uh, all the shepherds came and the angels were rejoicing. But it was months Potentially almost two years later by the time the Magi came. We talked a little bit about that last week, but we want to hone into that today. And if you found Matthew chapter 2 and verse 10, let's read what happened. It says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Talking about the Magi. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. They, they, uh, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. So if I could give you the backdrop storyline, the Magi were these wise men, or they were astronomers, potentially even astrologers. They studied the stars. They studied the heavenlies. They saw signs. They studied uh, prophecy things. Uh, for some of them, they were into black magic and things like that. And so the Bible calls these Magi, these wise men, men from the east. So they were, they, were, they were, you know, Middle Easterners, and they saw this star, and they recognized that there was prophecies that there would be a king, a messiah of Israel would come to earth. And when they saw this bright star, potentially a meteorite, whatever, God's uh, presence, whatever it was, they saw, they began to travel from the east to find the king of the Jews. They begin to, and so when they come into Jerusalem, and I, I mentioned this to you last week, they come in a giant fanfare. There's not just three wise men. There are multiple wise men. They are very wealthy. They are very powerful people from their, from their land. They are, very, uh, they, they are very astute and very studied, and they all probably have lots of servants, and they're not, they've been traveling for months, so they're not traveling um, in little small caravans. They've got to have guards with them so no one robs them because they're carrying a lot of wealth. They've got to have, you know, people help set up their tents and tear them down because they'll stay a couple days in a, in a spot. You know, if you go to travel across the United States to visit family, you're probably going to stop after about six hours or eight hours of driving, just get a hotel, stay the night, and then pick up the next day. So they were traveling like this as well. So when they come into Jerusalem looking for the Messiah, they had come with a giant fanfare. And then they get all of the rabbis and they say, well, the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. And so they said, oh, okay, well, you know, let's go find him. And we talked about last week, Herod said, won't you tell me where he's at? And Herod is the, the acting king, if you will, at the time, because he intends to kill off any child that might threaten his kingship. And so he makes plans to do that, and he's going to let the Magi find him and find uh, Jesus, and then he's going to come back around and kill him. That's his plan. So the Magi, as they begin to look again for Jesus, the star, if you will, reappears. It appears over their home. That at this point, Jesus is, again, probably somewhere between one years of age and two years of age. So he's a toddler. He's, he's a little, little, little fella. I mean, he is, all, I can't imagine how beautiful he was. And the Bible says, we'll pick back up, look again, in verse 10, it says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Why? Because the star start, started shining again over the home. So they, they hear it, yes, and they take off after it. And when they get to the place, it says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. And I want, you to, I want to point out to you, this is when gift giving started. This is when, when, when there was a revelation that God gave his greatest gift to earth, and we will then respond with a generous res response. We then will respond with, oh my goodness, you gave, you gave the king of glory. You gave men a way back to the Father. You gave the greatest gift of heaven. Listen, there is nothing more valuable in heaven than Jesus Christ. There is not, not, not the streets of gold, not some diamond doorknobs, whatever you can imagine. Jesus it was the most valuable commodity of heaven, and he came in the form of a child to bring us back to the Father, to give us a bridge back to the Heavenly One. And when the Magi see him, look what it says. It says they were overjoyed. And what was the first thing they did? First thing, write it down. First thing they did was they bowed down and they began to worship. 
They bow down and begin to worship. See, when you come into a real acknowledgement of who Jesus is, when you come into a real revelation, this life, it will come to an end and you'll spend eternity either in heaven or hell and you recognize that God sent a gift, the gift his son, his only begotten son, and that as you believe in him, you'll have life instead of death. The moment that revelation, of that, that understanding comes upon you, you can't help but get down and worship and say, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for, for giving me hope. Thank you, Jesus. And it says, they, number one, they got down and they bowed down and they worshiped him. Can I explain something to you? In Middle Eastern culture, if you bow down before somebody, you are submitting to their leadership in your life. The reason why most Christians struggle to engage with the Lord because they never bow down and let him be the leader of their life. They want to move Jesus from place to place with what they want. Jesus, I want this, so I need you to come do this for me. And then when Santa Claus Jesus doesn't give me what I want, then I'm mad at him. Opposed to, hey, Jesus, you are king. Wherever you go, I go. Whatever you want me to do, I do. My life is not my own. It belongs to you. This is the concept and the imagery that was happening with these very wealthy, very important, very powerful men from the east. They get down. They're, Magi actually, that word actually turns out little kings. They're kings. And they bow down before the king of kings and the lord of lords. And he's only one years old. Imagine the whole picture. Can you imagine being Mary? Like, okay. Imagine Jesus. I mean, I don't know. Does, is he royal in that moment? Like, I knight you. I mean, I don't know what he does as a one year old or one and a half year old. Can you picture that? Look at the second thing that it says that he does, and that they do, and that is they open their treasures. This is so powerful. They open their church. Friend, for you and I to have co hope come into our life, we have to come to this place of a generous response that hope has come into the world. We then have to respond properly because when you and I respond properly, it unkinks the hose. It, it, it breaks down the barriers. They immediately opened up their treasures. What's your treasure? What do you care about more than anything else in your life? What do you hold back from everyone else? What gift do you have that is so important to you that you would never let anyone else have it, get close to it, touch it, feel it. For some of you, the treasures of your heart, the treasures of your thought process, the treasures of what you've worked your whole life for, those degrees, that savings account, that house, that boat. See, these have become your treasures. What I love about the Magi, it says they opened up their treasures what was precious to them. And they begin to pour it out on this child. They begin to pour out their treasures. And I mentioned this to you last week. They were once, there wasn't just one little bar of gold and a little bit of, you know, a little jar of some frankincense and a little jar of myrrh. No, no, they begin to unload their camels. And they begin to unload crates of gold. They begin to unload crates of, of frankincense and myrrh. And it's just piling up. They unload their treasures. Here's the problem with most Christians, is they want God to do something for them, but they never unload their treasures to him. And this is where the breakdown happens and why hope is never coming into your life. And you're like, I just, I'm just hopeless. You know, I can't, I, it frustrates me to be around Christians who are still depressed, still frustrated, still aggravated. And the reason that is, is because hope has come. It's here. Why are you hopeless? I'll tell you why, because you're holding on to your treasure. This is important to me. And you and I both know this, I can't receive something new until I let go of what I have. And when I let go of what I have, then I can receive what is new. And these, Easter, what happened to all the Jews? Why are the Jews not bringing their treasures before the Lord their God? I'll tell you why, because familiarity uh, creates contempt. They've been so familiar with the things of God that they, they're so spoiled. And you know that. Think about trying to buy for your spoiled child. Mimi tells the story about me. I was, I was pretty spoiled. Uh, we didn't have, you know, when I was real young, I was the only child. I was the only grandchild. I was the only great-grandchild. I was the only nephew and nie uh, nephew to all the, you know, all the aunts and all that. So Christmas for me was presents. I, I, literally, I look like that puppy who's just got just boxes all around them. And M Mimi said I would rip them open and go, uh-huh, next. Rip them open, uh-huh, next. And then after an hour of having more present 10 times than anybody else in the room, I would say, is that it? <laughs> we were not wealthy people. I was just the spoiled golden child. I still act like that. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and it just, be, just because I become so used to receiving so much that I did not know how to give. I did not have a 
generous response to what was given me. I was a spoiled little kid. I can't tell you how many of us are spoiled when it comes to the Lord. Really, you have been so protected, you don't even realize it. You've been so cared for by the Lord that we don't realize that we've become stingy and we're no longer generous. Here's the third thing it says they did, is that they presented him with gifts. They opened up their treasures, which is a sign of opening up your heart. They opened up their treasures, and then they presented him with gifts. They actually made a presentation. Have you ever been, well, like, I have some friends that are African, and when I go to speak for them, they do a presentation. Pasta Adam is here today. He is a world traveler. He has a church called Church on the Hill in Cita Hill, Texas. It is with great honor today that we bestow upon him this right of beauty from our church, Emmanuel Baptist of the Southern or the Third Right Order of this and that church. And we want him to know the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. And it is with great. And then I walk out and they pin a little something on me, right? And I'm like, thank you very much. Because they go through the, come on, have you ever had an experience like that? Where they present, I mean, it's a present. Can you imagine? They, they begin to bring out the gold and they say, Jesus, here's gold. Bring the gold. They come marching out with gold, gold, gold. Frankincense, the next one steps up. And I have brought you the very best incense from the such and such. Its value is millions of dollars. And they start bringing and present it to him. And little Jesus, I would imagine, just standing there. And Mary's like, <laughs> and Joseph's like, yes, yes. Seriously, they poured out these gifts upon They poured out. Can I just bring out a little something to you? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, because we don't live in that era, that actually was a cultural uh, identification piece. When uh, frankincense, gold, and myrrh were presented in this moment, it was what was ha had happened for the last five, six hundred years. When one nation conquered another nation, the leaders of the conquered nation would come to the conquering king. They will have gathered up all of their treasures, gold, incense, and myrrh, and they would come and they would present that to the conquering king and say that you now control us, and we brought our very best. It was a standardization of what they were to bring. When the magi bring these specific gifts... They didn't bring silver. They didn't bring diamonds. Because the first time I read it, I was like, dude, I want some diamonds if they got that kind of money. But the standardization of cultural, you know, peace here would be that they literally were bringing the type of gifts that everyone would recognize. This means he is the conquering king and we are the subjects of his, of his authority. This is what those gifts were all about. They presented him, him with the very best that they had. It was a generous response to the fact that hope has come into the world. That God has brought in his hope. Do you know this is, this is not just at Jesus' birth. But when you look at the New Testament church. So Jesus lives his life out on the earth. He dies. He's resurrected. And then he ascends into heaven. And he tells them upon his ascension, go and wait. Because daddy is going to send you a new gift. I was here amongst you. But daddy's going to pour out the Holy Spirit on every one of you. You're going to have power. before. Now you have conviction. Now you have a way back to the Father. But then what God's going to do is he's going to pour out your, his Holy Spirit on you. And you will have power to overcome your own sin, your own weakness, the plans of the enemy. You, will, he, you shall receive power after which the Holy Spirit's come upon you. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 120 of them are just in a room. And they're just singing, oh, come, Lord, we love you. And all of a sudden, it says that the Spirit of the Lord fell upon all of it. Came, Holy Spirit came down and empowered them. And they began to prophesy. They began to speak in other tongues tongues, the power of God shook, and they went all outside. It was during a festival called Pentecost, and they're looking to see if everybody's received it. And tens of thousands of people, it would be like being at Mardi Gras. All these people are in the streets, and Peter stands up and says, hey, guys, I want to tell you something. You killed a guy named Jesus a few weeks ago. He was the Messiah. We saw him resurrect. We saw him in the flesh after being dead for three days. You missed it. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart. And they fell down on their face and said, what must we do to be saved? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in Jesus' name. So they did. So all of a sudden, 3,000 people became followers of Jesus. And the church had only been about 120. And you talk about a doubling or tripling, whatever percentage you want to put there. And now all of a sudden, there's 3,000 people people that are serving God and they don't really know what to do. So towards the end of chapter 2 of Acts, it says that they begin to meet every day in homes. 
That's why we do small group life. Because the early church had relationship with each other. They went to the temple where they received the word and they worshiped together. But then they had connection as a body of believers in homes all throughout the week. It says, and they committed themselves to prayer and studying the word. They committed themselves to engage fellowship, quantania with each other. And then it begins to say, and then people begin to get, more people begin to say, miracles started happening. And then I want to turn your attention to verse 44 of Acts 2. And it says, and all the believers were together. Everybody say together. And had everything in common. Everybody say everything in common. What does that mean? That means they shared everything they had with each other. And continue, continue reading, verse 45, selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he or she had need. Do you know what their natural response to hope coming into their life was? The natural righteous response was to be generous to each other, to be generous, to just pour it out. Look, I got some land, I'll sell it, I don't need it. That, that, what's that have to do with heaven? That ain't, that, that doesn't, I don't need that. You're in trouble, I'm going to help you. Now, hey, the church has to grow. We've got to, what they did in that moment was they brought their best gifts and they said, "We need this for the movement of God on the earth." And we're not going to be stingy with it. We're not going to. They were generous, friend. Can I tell you something? The moment the Magi, when the Magi experienced the living God, they just were generous. They just here. I don't. This because the reason why it is, it's because their treasures paled in comparison to heaven's treasure. It was so trite. Those chests of gold. It was trite compared to the fact that the king of glory is here, a gift from the Father to us, to all men. It was so trite. See, when you really have a true encounter with the living God, all the things that mean so much to you, like you can't tell, this is mine, bless God. I tell you, the preacher just wants the money. <laughs> all of that becomes so trite to you because you realize the great gift that was given you. Gift giving, it started 2,000 years ago. It started with the Father saying, you know what, you don't deserve this, but I love you. And I want you back. So I'm going to finance. I'm going to pay for our restoration of relationship. I'm going to send the very best, my son, Jesus. And the Magi, men from the east, are the only ones in that first moment that said, Dear God, we're going to give you what we have. In exchange, in exchange for the great gift you have, our stuff is nothing. Let us just lay it at your feet. And in that exchange, do you realize what they did? If you'll keep reading in that moment with the Magi, you know that from last week that Herod realizes that the Magi aren't going to come back and tell him where they're at, where Jesus is at. So he starts killing all the kids under age of two in that area. Joseph receives a dream from the Lord and says, go to Egypt. What I didn't bring out last week that I want to bring out this week is he goes to Egypt. He's a Jewish man. He cannot get a job in Egypt because he's Jewish. He's not a citizen of Egypt. How does he live for the next four years and support his family? Can I point out something else? By the time Jesus is an adult and starts his ministry at 30 years of age, the Bible says that he has an accountant, a treasurer. Why do you need a treasurer if you ain't got money? Where did he get money? What the Magi did in that moment was propagated, set legacy in motion for Jesus' ministry. For what Jesus needed to do on the earth, they financed it by way of their generous response for what God gave to them. you got to get this. I want you to understand something. You and I are in a season where we're supposed to be like, thank you, God, for what you've done. And what's happened to many of us, we stay in a moment of stinginess. Generosity versus stinginess. Friend, can I tell you something? Stingy people don't know they're stingy. Stingy people don't know they're stingy. Do you know why people are stingy? Out of fear. I worked hard for this. This is my treasure. If I give this away, what will I have? What will I get? From a stingy person, I can testify. Until you let go of your treasure and present your best to the living God, nothing can flow back to you. This is a spiritual principle. This isn't me trying to... Let me just say something to you. God don't need your money. He's rich. I hate when I hear preachers act like God don't, God's got to have your money to do something. No, God's got to have your heart to be able to do something in you. And where your treasures are, there your heart will be also, the scripture says. Stingy, think about, I love, how many of you guys love the Christmas carol? Charles Dickinson, where he talks about Scrooge. How many, you, you, 
That was from 1840. I love that story. And we've got a picture of, of one of the more recent ones from 2009, Jim Carrey playing the part, which was crazy, by the way, because he's crazy. But what a great mental picture. Of one of, I, and Scrooge has become a term that we use for the stingiest people around us. You old Scrooge. Scrooge didn't know that he was stingy. He thought he was being nice to let them have a little coal to put in the fireplace. As they're freezing, like, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. And it literally, in the storyline, what has to happen is, you know, that, that the ghost of the past and the ghost of the present has to take him and help him see that his stinginess is literally causing him to die an early death. In fact, can I just give you a couple of statistics? Stinginess is directly connected to stress. Did you know that? Stingy people have a higher output of cortisol, the stress hormone. In fact, uh, researchers from the University of Buffalo a couple years ago found that generous people have a lower risk of early death. Did you know that? You say, if you want to, because the scripture actually says that. Look at Proverbs chapter 11 with me, verse 24. He says, Proverbs eleven twenty four says, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but, become, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Uh, Adeline and I last night, uh, before she went to bed, we were watching uh, TV for a moment. And we were watching the Christian television channel. And, um, and they, were, they were these uh, guys that are missionaries in South Africa. And they're, you know, these cool surfer dudes that are there in South Africa. And they're teaching the kids how to surf. And um, as we're watching it, you have these these South African children who have nothing, who live in shanties, who don't know where they're going to get food from. And what these surfer missionary guys went in and did is they just wanted to give them an opportunity to smile and to hope. And they get them out there on these surfboards and, and teach them how to surf because they're living on the coastline. And these kids are smiling and they're laughing and they're testifying. Jesus came into my life. He changed me forever. I tell you, I will never be the same. I love my life. It's unbelievable. Jesus, you're the greatest. And these are 15 and 16-year-old kids who have nothing. And as Adeline, my 12-year-old, is watching that, she starts saying, Dad, they're some of the happiest people I've ever seen. Yeah. I said, yeah, baby. I didn't say anything. You, could, you live with a preacher, you know, you probably get tired of being preached at, you know. So I just didn't say anything. And she said, she goes, Dad, do you know why that is? She starts philosophizing. She said, do you know why that is? She says, people in America aren't that happy. You know why they're not that happy? Because we got too much. All we got is this stuff. And all we care about, they don't have nothing, but they have Jesus, Daddy. That's what we got to do, Daddy. We got to go around the world and tell them about Jesus, and then they can have hope again. I was like, dude, would you like to preach tomorrow morning? Would you like to preach tomorrow morning? Come on, girlfriend. See, I want you to understand something. You and I can be stingy, and we don't even know it. We can be holding back things from the Lord in our heart. Because it's so, because we're scared if we let this go, we won't have anything. But I wanted to point out to you, and that is this, that there's a power with generosity. There's a power that comes with generosity. Let me give you a couple thoughts on that. Number one, the first thing that happens when you and I are generous is it ushers in hope. It ushers in hope. When you and I are generous, what happens, it creates this pathway for hope to come. Uh, friend, can, can, when, you, when you start being nice to someone, when you start giving things to people, it, it, it just opens up this hope in your life and say, you know what, God, you're good. I don't need all this. I don't have to have all this. And when you see the exchange of generosity, when you give, what happens is God gives back to you. It's phenomenal what he does. There, it creates this whole pathway and ushers in this hope thing for you. You know, in, in our congregation, there's a sweet gal. Her family is magnificent. I don't know how many of you know Dorothy Ann, but Dorothy Ann Dallenhauer and her husband, they're, the, they're one of the finest families in our whole church. A couple of years ago, Dorothy was pregnant, um, and we were so excited about this child, and then she got the diagnosis that that child had uh, trisomy 13, which it's missing, you know, one of the pieces it's supposed to have, and the doctors immediately said, this child will not live, and our suggestion is that you terminate the preg pregnancy, that you, uh, that you abort the baby. And because they're God-fearing folks, they're like, no, no we, don't, we don't kill life. We don't do that. And so, and so they knew that there was going to be this situation. And so they went full term with that child and gave birth to her. And, and they named her Grace. And, uh, and, and she literally lived for 56 minutes. 
And they called me, and so I came over after the baby had passed and held, held the child in my arms and prayed with them and prayed over the baby. And, and you know, I, it's a tough place to be as a pastor. I want to see that baby raised from the dead. I, and, I, and, and Dorothy Ann and, and Dustin, they just said, Pastor, it's in God's hands. His will be done. It's all good. And most of the time when someone goes through a tragedy like that as a pastor, I then know that the next six months, one of two things is going to happen. Always. They're either going to blame God, blame the world, get mad. Most of the time, they shrink back. Most of the time, they have been engaged with the Lord, engaged with his people. They've been generous, and what will happen is they'll shrink back. They don't realize they become stingy. They're holding on because tragedy has hit them, and so they don't want anything bad to happen. And so they begin to circle the wagons. They begin to, to build walls around everything that's precious because they, they've already lost one thing that's precious, and they don't want that to happen again. And so they just kind of isolate themselves off, and then when you do that, you begin to die on the inside of the walls that you built around you to protect you. They become your prison walls. You think they're your protective walls, but they actually prison you in. Dorothy did the opposite. She began to write. It's her gift. She began to use her gift. She began to give away. She began to write songs to the Lord. And she began to, she decided she was going to put a CD together, an album together, in remembrance of Gracie, who had passed away, who didn't, who only lived 56 minutes. The other day, last week, when I was teaching on hope, Dorothy pulled me aside and she said, Pastor, this series is magnificent. She said, I remember deciding whether or not I was going to give hope after the loss of, of baby Gracie. I remember deciding yes or no. And I said, I'm going to be a dispenser of hope. And to hear you teach on this, God is saying something to my heart right now. He's telling me to be generous. I'm thinking, I'm preaching generosity next week. Well, just go ahead and prophesy to the pastor. Go on ahead. And she said, the Lord's telling me to take my CDs and give them away free this Sunday coming, if that would be okay with you. Would you be okay with that? I was like, girlfriend, I don't think you realize when hope comes into our life, the proper response is we become generous with others. And so Dorothy Ann has her CDs out in the lobby. And let me just give you one of the main lines on one of the best songs on a CD. And this is what she wrote. Even when you feel all hope is gone, you can be assured that you're not alone. There will be a light to see you through. Don't give up on your hope. He'll make things new. She titled her CD, Always Hope, after the loss of a child. Who does that? Who does that? I'll tell you who does that. People who realize that the greatest gift ever was given to me. And I'll not treasure up my treasures or hide them behind my wall. But I'll open up my treasures and bring my gifts before the Lord. She brought her gift, her talent, her musical gifting. And she brought it before the Lord and she gave the best. Of, and now she wants to share that with you. So as you go to exit today, you can go by, her, by the little table that we set up. And those CDs are free for you. And if you lost a child or you've been through something tragic, you're struggling with hope. I think you ought to get this. It'll help give you strength again and remind you that though you may have lost some hope in an area, Jesus is the great hope, and he'll bring it back around. Are you with me? Say yes. Oh, ain't that good? Here's the second thing that when you and I are generous that it does, and that is it stores up treasures in heaven. When you and I are generous, that generosity actually becomes, if you will, deposits into your account in heaven. And you say, ooh, you're just making that up. No, actually, that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18. Can I read that to you? Say yes. Thank you for letting me read the word of God to you. It says, tell them to use their money to do good. 1 Timothy 6, 18. Tell them to use their money to do good. This is the new living, so that's why it sounds so, uh, you know, street language. Uh, tell them to use their money to do good. They should, be, they should be rich in good works. And they should give happily to those in need. Those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. Verse 19. By doing this, they will be storing up real treasures for themselves in heaven. It is... The only safe invest investment for eternity. And they will be living a fruitful Christian life down here as well. As you are generous with others, God says literally, you will be storing up for yourself riches in heaven. You'll be making deposits in heaven. As well as, he says, as well as you'll be living a, fru a fruitful life in this life down here. Generosity was the response that the Magi have. Generosity was the response of the New Testament church when the Holy Spirit was poured upon them. When you and I become stingy, it's proof that we've lost hope. When you and I are stingy, it's proof that we have, we've lost hope. Because we say, if I give this away, 
I won't ever get it back. Friend, when you and I are generous, we're saying, God, I'm, I'm giving what it's need. I have it. I want to give it. And as I give it, Lord, I know that you will not be mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. And that you will not be indebted to no man, the scripture says. And that as I give liberally, as I'm helpful to others, as I'm, as I'm generous, that you will pour out on me more than I can handle. The Bible actually says, press down, shaken together, running over what God calls others to give to you. This is his way. Generosity is proof that hope is active in your life. Stinginess is proof that you have become hopeless in a particular area, in a particular way of living. And I would challenge you to be generous this, this year. Here's the last piece that generosity does. Number one, as we said, the power of generosity, it ushers in hope. Number two, it stores up treasures in heaven. And number three, it establishes legacy. It establishes legacy. I pointed this out to you. When the Magi brought their gifts to Jesus, it established his legacy. It financed. They paid it forward, if you will. It when the New Testament church began to bring all that they had and just lay it at the apostles' feet and just begin to take care of one another and sold property and land, their generosity, what it did was it started a legacy culture in Christianity. Christi Do you know who built the first hospitals? Christians. Do you know who built the first orphanages? Christians. Why? Because in our culture, it's generosity. Where did it come from? Because God was generous with us. The New Testament church responded and created a generosity culture. Just bring it. We don't need it. We've got heaven. God will provide our needs. Let's take care of one another. Where did that come from? Guys, that didn't come from a little dude in a red suit. They came from Jesus Christ, the gift of heaven to earth. And then our response is generosity back. And that's what's propelled ministry forward. You're sitting in a building today that you did not pay for. Another church called Destiny Church. Magnificent group of people. You're sitting in their blood, sweat, and tears. They financed this facility. It was an old food line grocery store. They bought it, remodeled it. They were up here every day working on this building, putting their best gifts forward. I'm talking, look, I've, I've interviewed some of them. They gave, oh my, they emptied their savings account. So that their people could have a church building to meet in. We, on the other hand, was a church that was, we were up and coming out of our living room. And we needed a building. And this church came to a place of transition. We are sitting in what they built. The chairs, they paid for those chairs. You hadn't bought any chairs. They paid for them. You are sitting in legacy because someone else paid it forward. Do you realize that? What about the guys coming behind us? What about our children and our grandchildren? See, what happens so many times with stingy people, you just live for the now. You don't think about legacy to come. What about the other churches that need to be birthed? There are 300,000 new people coming into the Metroplex a year. 300,000. I'm from Louisiana. Our capital city, Baton Rouge, was only 300,000. 300,000 new people are moving into the Metroplex. Who's, gonna, who's, who's planning legacy for their salvation? Who, who's planning campuses to go get them? We are. So you and I have to pay it forward. We have to be generous in this moment. So our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will have a pathway to the Father. They say, you know what? We paid for that. We, we built those buildings. We, we, we started those missions. We, we gave to that. Even in the hard times where we were at, we created legacy so that you could be here today, baby boy. So you could be here today, sweetheart. Listen, everything we're doing is paying it forward for the next believer to come. For the next one to say, I didn't know. Man, where, where did this church come from? I didn't know y'all were here. Yeah, we've been crying out for your soul for the last 20 years and now you're here we've been paying it forward putting the lights together putting all this stuff in. we've been creating these ministry opportunities for you to get a part of that you would have never been reached had we not gone and done that we paid it forward so that you now can invest in the kingdom business for the others who will come behind you we stand on the shoulders of great men and women who paid it forward they created legacy and i'd be doggone in my lifetime if we were going to be stingy and we're not going to pay it forward for the next group coming behind us are you with me say yes the Magi did it, and the early church did it. So with that being said, as I go to close, it's Christmas. And I have two asks for you. The first thing I would ask you as your pastor is I would ask that you'd start being generous to others in need. Somebody on the street that you live on. A co-worker. I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about being nice. Some of you struggle to be nice to people who've been mean. You've got to learn to be generous. One of the things that I've learned over the years to do is be generous with my love. People get around me and say, man, you're so nice. You're always loving folks. Yeah, because I used to be stingy with that. 
And I learned to open up my heart. And when I opened up my heart, hope flooded in. As I was generous and I gave to people who don't deserve it. I'm nice to people who are mean. That's hard to do every day. But I've started and created that culture in my life. I'm asking you to start being generous with others. Those who don't deserve it. Those who don't work for it. I want you to be, I want you to be like Jesus. He came and he died. He lived so that you and I could have a way back to the Father. He created that pathway. He was generous. And the Bible says it like this. When we were yet sinners, he died for us. He didn't wait for us to act right. He loved us when we didn't love him. He was kind to us when we hated him. And he was gracious. I want you to be the same. Here's the second ask that I would like you to do with me. And I would like you to look before the Father. I'd like, to get on your, I'd like you to pray before the Lord. And before the end of the year... I want you to give a legacy gift to Church on the Hill financially. I want you to, I want you to say, you know what, I want, I want to pay it forward. I want to pay it forward. We're going to do some remodeling of the buildings. We're trying to start more campuses. It all comes down to resources. At the end of the day, guys, I want to just tell you this. What we give is what we're able to do. What we don't give limits us from doing more. That's the bottom line. And so with that being, that's, you, you know me, you've been with me all year long. I don't do big pitches for money. Why? Because at the end of the day, if Jesus can't finance his church, he ain't Jesus. But he uses us to do it. And so I want you to dream legacy with me. What do we need to do so that our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will know Jesus Christ? What changes do we got to constantly be making? We've We've got to constantly be reaching into where they're at. We can't keep doing things the way we did it 20 years ago or 10 years ago. We've got to constantly be moving forward. So just ask the Lord. I'm not going to give you a number, but when you go to our website, when you go to the app, when you go to give, if you're going to give through the envelopes over the next couple of weeks, just write legacy on it. And this is outside of your tithe. Just say, I want to pay forward ministry that is to come. I want to give a gift towards that. I don't care if it's a dollar, 50 cents. I don't care about the amount. That's not what I'm asking. I'm trying to break, break the stinginess off of our hearts. I'm trying to give us a light of eternity. I'm trying to, I want us to think beyond right here, right now. I just pay my bills and just trying to survive life. I want you to see what's to come and I want us to give towards that. I want us to say, we will be able to say one day, sweet love, you standing up on that stage? That's because 30 years ago we gave towards that. That campus is standing there, that's because we gave towards that back in 2020. At the end of 2019, we started giving towards that. As we go to close today, I would remind you that stingy people don't know they're stingy. They've they've been overtaken by fear in a particular area. And let it be said of Church on the Hill that we're the generous people with our love, with our kindness, with our finances, with, 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 with the word of God, with truth. Let us be generous.